I have with me uh, Donna DiStefano, from, who is the Assistant Director of the Tennessee Disability Coalition and is the Tennessee State Affiliate of the Network, Network ADA Network Administrator for the Southwest ADA Center. She has been um, a presenter in ADA training and an in-state resource for individuals with disabilities, state and local governments, and businesses within Tennessee. I also have Louise McCown, and she is the Public Awareness Coordinator and Systems Change Advocate for the East Tennessee Technology Access Center. She also serves as chair of the Anderson County Commission ADA Oversight Committee and on the board of the Oak Ridge Art Center where she takes pottery and jewelry classes. Um, I want to kind of go over the ground rules. We have a lot of information to cover. Please hold your questions. You might want to write them down. We'll have a question and answer period and we'll have someone who will bring around microphones. Um, and as we get started, the um, one of the first things I want to talk about is your audience. Um, and, in, and the idea of embracing for, ec the economics of embracing for inclusiveness. Um, the aging population is the first place I want to start. People are living longer than ever. By 2030, 20% of the U.S. population is projected to be over 65. This demographic has never represented this large a portion of the U.S. population. Historically, this is a core audience for arts organization and presenters. This demographic, demographic does, often does not self-identify as disabled, but at least 60% of this demographic has at least a partial disability. Use of human-centered design makes sense if we are going to speak to the needs of this growing population. Research also suggests that participation and involvement in the arts increases brain function. And here is my first large bullet point. Accessibility is not just good policy, but good business. Another potential audience. Um, we have obviously lots and lots of soldiers coming home from the various wars that are going on in our world. More soldiers are returning home. 97% of veterans surveyed in 2009 requested special needs service. This demographic has never represented this larger portion of the US. High rates of physical and mental disabilities. Use of human-centered design, again, makes good business. Um, another potential audience is um, the autism spectrum. Autism spectrum disorders are increasing sharply. Research on autism in the arts is ongoing. Autism-friendly performances have received great success. Research also suggests that Autism-friendly um, performances and, aut and arts activities for people on the autism spectrum um, has been able to do many things. Another potential audience, ethnic minorities accounted for over 50% of the U.S. population growth in the 2010 census data. Tennessee data follows that national trend. The Latino community, the African American community account for the largest centers of growth. Considering this data, considering not just the idea of complying with federal regulations, um, the idea of making sure that our, our services, our programs, everything about what we do in arts and arts programming has to be inclusive for survival. Now I want to get to the uh, federal rights regulations. The two main ones that uh, we will be discussing today is the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's a very familiar act, and we will talk some, about some specific details. And in addition, we're going to talk about the American Disabilities Act of 1990. Um, oftentimes, you may know this as opposed to, you may know it by ADA, you may know it, know it by Title III or 504, um, in 2010, there were new requirements that were passed. Those are some things that you need to be aware of. And because of these uh, regulations, our anti-discrimination policy, which if you've received a grant from us, you have signed a, um, an assurance page assuring that you 
know and understand what these requirements are. No person on the grounds of race, color, national origin, disability, age, religion, or sex shall be excluded from participation in or be denied benefits of or otherwise be subject to discrimination of services, programs, and employment provided by the Commission and its contracting agencies. And uh, just a little note, each one of you, as a as a as a either a grantee or a, a federal, I mean a state agency, or or however you are, are in the mix, should have some kind of, of policy in regard to discrimination. So who does this apply to? If you receive federal funding of any sort, if you receive uh, for for us our grantees, um, whether it's a public grantee, a private grantee, a nonprofit, whether you're a subcontractor or a contractor, you're receiving federal funding. Um, and um, and in uh, at the Arts Commission, whether it's a you're um, a multicultural institution or a partner receiving partnership support, all of those have federal funding attached to them. Anyone who, re anyone who receives federal funding, either from the NEA, Artworks Projects, which, is in, which is not funneled through the Tennessee Arts Commission, but is something that individuals, uh, organizations can apply for artworks, or the Our Town Grant, we've talked about that here at the, at the uh, session uh, at uh, the conference today, or other TAC grants, or maybe you're receiving funding from the DOE through arts education funding. We have the first um, law I want to discuss is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, Title VI, as we call it, uh, in everyone's packet to, when you registered, you will find a Title VI poster. Um, that Title VI poster is part of the Title VI program. Um, if you require additional posters, you need them, all you have to do is call me and I will make sure you get it. Um, here we have the, the actual the way the law is written that no person, this is on the grounds of race, color, and national origin. Those are the three most things you need to remember that Title VI covers, is race, color, or national, national origin. Um, here at the Commission, we have, um, these are, those of you who have gone through grant activities will remember these, seeing these um, um, racial identifications. We have African American, Hispanic or Latino, Native American, Alaska uh, or Alaska Native, Native Haitian or uh, Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, Asian or other, any other racial or group. And that's an, an other category. Uh, make sure that when you are filling out your grant applications um, that you are actively describing your either project race are your grant are the grantee race of the organization and just for a little bit of a kind of a clarification for the organization if your board is 51 or more percent um, people of one of these uh, nationalities then that would cover that would be your grantee race if your project is, let's say it's centered at, um, a, a centered in a school that you know it's centered at a particular audience, that becomes the project race. So just make sure that we're able to keep act, act, adequate data. Let's get on to a little bit of conversation on self-assessment. One of the things that's required by both ADA and by Title VI is that there should be a designated staff member um, either it doesn't have to be, it could be a volunteer, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's a paid employee or not paid employee, but there has to be a designated staff member to monitor compliance of Title VI or ADA. Um, they have to look at it from policies and procedures, programming, and the idea of LEP, which is limited English proficiency. proficiency. Um, and I will, let's continue. One of the things that this volunteer can do is to be, is can train staff on the importance of Title VI. Have a known method for reporting and resolving complaints. On the TAC Arts Commission page, on the Title VI page, you will find um, a complaint form. You will find a complaint resolution form. You will find information regarding the whole entire procedure so you don't have to recreate any, anything. You can use that information as a vehicle for you being in compliance. 
um, and you can report your complaints either to um, someone who has a complaint. Uh, if it's within your agency, they can come to you and report. Um, they can report to the TAC, that would be to my office, or they can also report to the, to the State Human Rights Commission. All programs and services are just need to be designed to be free of discrimination. So some of the questions you might want to ask yourself, is, my, is it open to the public? Is it marketed to the entire population? Is there a Title VI a poster available for staff or volunteers? And in one important aspect of this is to work with your board and your executive director to identify any barriers or possible corrective action. You know, the, the conversation is the most important piece. Beginning that conversation to look at ways of being more inclusive from the top down. One of the uh, parts of uh, both ADA and Title VI is the survey. In the past, some of our previous grantees will know that surveys were included in the grant process. Right now, they are not included in the grant process, but they are, will be available online as an organizational tool. And I would strongly encourage you to use those tools and, if you, and to go ahead and fill out those surveys and then send them back to the TAC, not about compliance, but as a way of, of just having someone work with you. If there's any questions anytime you have anything in regard to these issues, that's why, that's why I am here. And one of the things that these surveys do is they force you to look at your programming and they force you to, to kind of begin that conversation. This will be about English proficiency. Sangrando. Do you speak English? English, no. Mi nieta se cayó a través del piso. Vivimos en la calle 9, número 529. I am not getting an address. Are you using a cell phone? What is your address? Um, Adresso. I need adresso. Okay, adresso. I don't understand. Speak English. Is there someone there that speaks English? Can someone help me here? Does anyone speak Spanish? I'm sorry. No Spanish. English. Call back with... I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. Please, please call back with someone who speaks English. Since its earliest beginnings, one of America's greatest enduring strengths has been its inclusion and integration of individuals who speak a variety of different languages. Whatever our language, we are bound together by shared dreams and an adherence to a common set of legal principles governing our society. One of those legal principles is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. No person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Let's focus on one part of Title VI, the prohibition against discrimination on the basis of national origin. What is national origin? It is different from citizenship or even where one was born. Simply put, national origin refers to ancestry and national origin discrimination encompasses all actions that treat a person or group of people differently or more harshly because of that ancestry. One characteristic often associated with ancestry is language. Discrimination based on an individual's inability to speak, read, write, or understand English may be a type of national origin discrimination. If individuals have a limited ability to speak, read, write, or understand English, they are Limited English Proficient, or LEP. All state and local governments and all other entities that receive financial assistance from the federal government are called recipients. Recipients include entities such as hospitals, police departments, housing authorities, unemployment centers, and state agencies such as food stamp offices, welfare and social service agencies, and many others. Recipients must provide LEP individuals meaningful access to important benefits, information, services, encounters, and rights that are available to individuals who speak English. Title VI has been part of our nation's civil rights laws since 1964. Presidential Executive Order 13166 directed federal agencies to provide their recipients with guidance 
on how to comply with Title VI by taking reasonable steps to provide meaningful access to LEP persons. The order also told federal agencies themselves to provide meaningful access to LEP persons. So what does it mean to provide meaningful access? Although there are many factors that can be used, the federal guidance focuses on the following four factors to consider when determining how to provide meaningful access. First, the number or proportion of LEP persons in the community. The more people who speak a particular language and are eligible to be served or likely to be encountered, the more services in that language are needed. Second, the frequency of contact the recipient has or should have with LEP persons. The more frequent the contact, the greater the need for interpreters, translators, or other language assistance tools. Third, the nature and importance of the benefit, service, communication, or information to the LEP person. The more important, the more likely high-quality and timely language services are needed. Another way to think of this is to determine the consequences to an LEP person if communication is not effective. Fourth, the resources available, along with the costs of providing language assistance. Smaller programs with more limited budgets generally are not expected to provide the same level and expense of language services as larger programs with larger budgets. Balancing these factors will help to determine the level of language services necessary to provide meaningful access. And just a note uh, in regarding to meaningful access. Um, you know, we have a program um, and we are, are working, you know, when things come up, um, please contact us and, 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 and we can and I can discuss um, any needs you have with regard to um, LEP issues. Um, ADA, provide a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against people with disabilities. A little bit about the structure. It's divided into basically five titles. You have Title I, which is employment, Title II, which are state and local governments, Title III, which are private entities. And most of you as grantees, if you're a grantee of the Tennessee Arts Commission, you come under Title III, which is why sometimes it's called, you'll see, Title III 504, because it's Section 504 that you're complying with. Title IV is telecommunications, and Title V is miscellaneous. I thought it was important for us to really define what a disability is. An individual who has a record or history of, of or is regarded as having a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. In the first part, that's an individual who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. These are just examples. I'm not going to read them aloud, but you can see these examples of major act life activities. Oh, sorry. Here we go. These are some additional ones. Substantial limitation of a major life activity. Compare with most, you, to, to find out how that fits as you compare it with most people. It should not require extensive analysis. And the most important part about this is Congress that looks at this with broad coverage. So there's no, if you're looking for a fast and hard line on what's a disability and what's not, you're not going to find that so easily. Because there's not this kind of black and white interpretation. As a scenario, Mr. A has cerebral palsy. It takes him about two hours to walk a mile. He is able to walk with no pain. Uh, show of hands, does he have a disability? Um, episodic impairments are impairments that go into remission are considered disabilities if they substantially limit a major life activity. Some examples might be depression, bipolar disorder, epilepsy, and cancer. Mr. B is diagnosed with depression. She'll be fine for months, Mrs. B, but a few times a year she becomes severely depressed and has difficulty sleeping and taking care of herself. The depression usually lasts a week. Does she have a disability under ADA? Definition of disability, second part. 
an individual who has a record of a physical or mental impairment that sub substantially limits a major activity. Another scenario, Mr. C had cancer eight years ago. For a year, he was ill. He had difficulty walking more than a few yards. He was unable to work. Mr. C has been cancer and symptom free for six years. Is he protected from discrimination under the ADA? Yes. Definition of disability in the third part. An individual who is, who is regarded as having a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a ma major activity. Now note, people covered under, th under the regarded as part of the definition do not have rights to reasonable accommodations. Here's an example. Mrs. D has facial scars from a fire that occurred when she was young. As a result of the scars, many employers have refused to hire her because the concerns about other employees and clients' reactions. Has she been regarded as disabled? Exactly. Is that no or yes? No. These are some exclusions to, to ADA. They're pretty self-explanatory. ADA, what does it include? General non-discrimination, ensuring effective communication, facility accessibility, and employment. A man who is blind and uses a mobility cane goes to a museum alone. The security guard won't let him in because the guard is concerned that the man will walk into the artwork. Has the museum violated the ADA? General non-discrimination requirements ensure people with disabilities have equal opportunity to participate and benefit. Pro prohibit exclusion, segregation, and unequal treatment based on disability. Prohibit eligibility, prohibit eligibility criteria that screen out persons with disability unless the criteria are necessary. Communication with people who have disabilities. This is a kind of a different subject and fortunately we're going to have, um, my two panelists are going to in just a bit assist me with this much better than I can articulate it. Um, but I think it's important that we as arts organizations um, really think about how we relate to these potential audience to and how we can better program for inclusiveness. Um, if necessary, to ensure effective communication, unless undue burden, which we'll discuss in a bit. Here we have assistive listening, often, often called ALS. These are the, um, those of you who are um, in, um, uh, in large presenter organizations know all about these, but there are even some resources for smaller organizations. Um, the big thing about today is I want you to walk away thinking of here is that this is not about how much money this is going to cost. This is about how I can get some services. And there are, there are technology access organizations um, in, that can help you get the technology you need. There are networks of people. And so if you start contacting me, we can discuss this and find ways of getting the technology that you need. Open and closed captioning. The difference between open and closed captioning is that closed captioning requires you press that button on your remote. Open captioning is when it's, no matter when it's on, it's captioning is on. And right now, the new requirements of the federal law are requiring that anything that is posted and your audience, if your primary audience is the web, then if that is your only audience, it has to be open captioned. It has to be captioning. Um, computer this uh, cart systems. If you've ever seen them, they're really, really wonderful. They're real-time um, translation um, information for people who are for the um, for the impaired, and they um, they're expensive. Um, but that's something that can possibly, you know, what would happen if a larger organization had a cart and then they were able to somehow rent or share that with other arts organizations in their community. There's all kinds of things to consider. Um, we have qualified interpreters on site through, or through video remote interpreting. 
These are just a few options about ways that we can be inclusive in our programming. Inclusive, I will have some um, closing remarks a little bit later, but now I would love for um, my first uh, presenter, uh, Ms. Donna DiStefano, um, and she will, she will talk to us in regard to sensitivity and inclusiveness. Thank you, William. And I'm just going to briefly stand up and wave at the people that can't see me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, feel free to move. <laughs> I think you guys deserve an amazing amount of credit because you're still here after a very long day and you're sitting and you're listening. Um, so thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, we, we have a lot to share. We have a little bit of amount of time right now. But one of the points that, that Williams underscores, and, and we will too, is this is just an introduction for some of you. For some of you, it's, it's information you already know. But there are resources in, in your community. We are resources. William's a resource if you, if you need us. When you get into talking about the ADA, there's a lot of detail into that and what does it mean and, and for different kinds of things. So it can be complex. It's case by case. It's very specific. And, and, and those are the kinds of things that through my agency I can assist you with or some I can get you connected with some folks in your in your local agency to sort of help think through what the issue what the what the situation is what the issue is and talk through it because a lot of times you think it may be pretty self-evident but no probably not because we usually say about the ADA it just depends so there are no easy answers so that being said um, as I talk uh, you will see behind me so you can look over here at something more interesting uh, we have some artwork by people with disabilities. A lot of these um, pieces are hanging in our building in Nashville. We have a cooperative building with six other six agencies, five other agencies with the Tennessee and the Tennessee Disability Coalition. The coalition owns the building; the other folks lease it, and so there are a number of disability-related organizations: Autism Society, Middle Tennessee, Tennessee Mental Health Consumers Association. Center for Independent Living in Middle Tennessee, um, support and training for exceptional parents, which helps parents of kids that receive special education services receive the training they need, Brain Injury Association of Tennessee, is that five? Ooh, I might be leaving somebody out. Okay, um, I'm roughly there. But however, we have a number of pieces of art. Some of them are, are done by folks with autism, some by folks with um, mental health issues, some by folks with physical disabilities, so it's a nice variety. But one thing about it is it really creates a nice space to live in. And I think one of the things that you folks have, and, and because of what you do, is, is, is you have access to beauty on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> with what you, um, the, the types of things that, you know, whether it's you know, visual arts or some other kinds of arts or theater, it, that's, that is so compelling, and, um, and that really helps to breathe life into all of us. And so this presentation is just to remind you that people with disabilities are just part of everybody. Um, and um, as William had talked about, the, the ADA is now um, 22 years old. It was signed into law in 1990. A few take-home things for you, if you take nothing else, it's about civil rights. It's not affirmative action. It's about non-discrimination. And my HR person and our, our human resource person in our agency will say, discrimination, don't do it. <laughs> it's like, yes. <laughs> A lot of times easier said than time, but. And it's, it's basically about equal access for people with disabilities. Leveling the playing field. Equal, not more, not less. Now, people will need some accommodations due to disabilities at different times, but that's just to help equalize the experience. Um, key areas for success for what you do and for what all of us do. And it, one thing I, I always say to folks is, is um, we have to police ourselves too. <laughs> um, and, you know, sometimes we fall down on, oops, not quite great access, and we, and we have to fix that. So, and we're a disability organization, and there are other disability organizations in our building and that are part of our coalition. 
and we have to remind each other sometimes that you need to make it accessible and and let's figure out a way to do that that you can do it that that makes sense for that person for that situation or broad based for a number of people so some key areas basic architectural physical access and what's accessible for for folks with physical disabilities makes the whole environment more accessible for everybody more people will choose a ramp than stairs you put the two side by side there's been research on it and I try to and I try as I try to walk up I try to think what am I doing <laughs> um, Programs and services. Um, William had talked about reasonable accommodation unless there's a direct threat to health and safety. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of, of ifs, ands, buts, and, and what's the situation. And, and so that, your obligation is to take a look at what's going on and try to figure out and get, and get some resources. Call William, call me, call some of the other folks. Call Louise if you're in East Tennessee. Um, and, 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 try, and just try to figure it out, get the, get the help, because sometimes there aren't any quick, real easy answers. And I'll tell you, as part of a network um, of ADA centers, there are 10 that have been funded across uh, since the ADA started to help with understanding the ADA and case law and these kinds of things. And a lot of times what I'll end up doing is, you know, if I don't know, and it's kind of complex, I just shoot the, the whole thing out to my network in the southeast region and say, okay, here's the situation. I need your help. What's going on here? And we go back and forth. And then, you know, that's, that's part of what you have to do because, as I said before, there are no easy answers sometimes. Sometimes there are. Discrimination, don't do it, you know. Um, but other times it is much more complex and you really need to talk through it and think through it with somebody or a group of people. And that's what part of we're, what we, we, we are here for. Um, auxiliary aids and, 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 that, um, and services that William talked about, the interpreter services, the Braille, those kinds of things. Again, effective communication so that, so that the communication you have can be effective. And that comes with it, lots of ifs, ands, buts, and hows to do, how to do that. And we have very limited time to get into any detail on that. Um, Key, key points for you folks, really, it, it, our agency has been involved with the Frist Center for the Visual Arts in, in Nashville since before they opened. Be they called us the September before the April that they opened to say, we're going to be opening in April. We want to train every single one of our staff and volunteers and docents and, and everybody else about disability awareness and, and, and what, we, what we need to do to ensure that people with disabilities coming to the Frist Center have a good experience like we want everybody else to have. So we started with a, you know, a panel and we, and we for a number of years had this little panel as part of their ongoing training. And I think there, I'm not sure if she's here right now, but there's somebody from the Frist here today. They're, they're doing it on their own now. I mean, they were like, but we, we got it. But one of the things that they have done is to continue to involve a number of folks from the disability community in their councils, on their boards, when there are things that they know, their exhibitions or, or things that they're having, events that they're having that they have questions about, they, they, they know the people to call because they've been involved with different folks, different people with disabilities, adults, kids. So they call them and they say, okay, this is what we're planning to do, you know, next year, because you people do plan ahead. <laughs> um, and, and sit down with a group of people and say, okay, what's going to work? What do we need to do? And it works out really well, and, and to their credit. So good customer service. Respecting the person, focusing on the person. Those are, those are critical pieces, just like everybody else. Good customer service. One of the folks that we used to do, they, I know I'm taking up more time than I thought I would. I'm trying to go fast to give Louise more time. One of the folks that we used to do the training at the first with um, is, is a, a man who was in a motorcycle accident from many years ago and is quadriplegic. And he, he, one of the big things he, points he would try to make is just because you have a disability doesn't make you a nice guy. You know, you're going to get some real jerks and, just, and, and that may try to use their disability. You, if you have good customer service, 
if you know what you're going to do with anybody that comes up and behaves like a jerk, they get equal treatment. <laughs> right? It's equal. So, um, so accessible design, volunteer training, involving folks from the disability community and things you do are, are just fabulous things to do. I want to leave you with some thoughts that some folks with disabilities have um, shared with me as I was preparing this presentation. Um, we got, uh, there was an, um, an email that this university junior, I think she's in East Tennessee, had written this little article. And she was talking about how people respond to her because she's in a wheelchair. And uh, she said 90% of the time she's able to have normal interactions. Um, but there are some jokes that people say that just aren't funny. And she recognizes that people are trying to be humorous, but then she says, they're just not funny. Like, hey, when can I ride that? And she's like, ha, ha, ha. The answer is never because it's not a toy. <laughs> Other people will say to her, man, I need one of those, speaking of her wheelchair, and she'll say, no, you don't. <laughs> um, I mean, ouch, you ran over my foot. And, you know, she's like, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said that, you know, she'd be really wealthy and could afford to, you know, just pay for school on her own. Um, she also said, you know, if I'm just sitting there and, you know, like a, quote, normal person, whatever that is, um, you know, just, you know, treat me like you would anybody else. I'm probably just texting, right? I mean, it's a young kid, right? A, a, a college student. One of the folks that works in our agency at the Center for Independent Living said, said to me that um, at an airport she had a woman ask her if she could walk. She's in a wheelchair. Can you walk? She said, no. And the person said, well, have you tried? <laughs> there you go. I just forgot to even try. Um, <laughs> you know, and, then, and she's just like, you just can't make this up. And, you know, people <laughs> say these things. And it's like, how, how absurd can that be? Um, there was another person that was on our first panel who was um, deaf. You know, who was deaf. And she would tell the story about how she, would, she was at an airport she got off a plane, she needed to know the gate to the next, where she needed to be. She can lip read pretty well, um, so she was asking for that. Because her speech sounded a little differently, the person get, held up their finger with a, you know, just a, a hold on, wait a minute, took off, comes back about five minutes later with a wheelchair, plunks her into the wheelchair and takes her to the gate. Okay, not the accommodation she needed. She actually just needed the information as to the gate number. She would have been able to read the lips. Anyway, so, um, and Louise reminded me of um, Itzhak Perlman, famous violinist, who has polio, walks with crutches, has an aide that, that um, carries things for him. And more often than not, when he's interacting with people, the people talk to his assistant and not to him. And this is a famous person, right? So for non-famous people, they get that all the time. And it's like, woohoo, over here. You know? So remember, again, to focus on the person, talk to the person. Even if there's an interpreter in the room, you talk to the person. And the person's, you know, if the interpreter's interpreting, you can listen, but just, again, focus on the person. So um, I've taken up a little bit more than oh, I had no. planned to, but thank you very no. much. I will say we have tons of these disability etiquette in English and Spanish out there. Feel free to take. I, bought, I brought 300 with me, I, and I'm leaving them. <laughs> so please take those. And now Louise is going to um, do this next part, which is, which is really the meat of, so what does it mean to include people with disabilities in art? Because she is many things, including an artist. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> um, I never considered myself an artist um, until I was asked to be on the board of the Aquatic Art Center, and they said to me, oh, you can make pottery, and I went, no, and they showed me how. Um, and uh, the only reason I was asked to be on the board is I know state legislators and they wanted someone who would go to a Saturday Day and feel comfortable 
talking with all these guys. So, um, all right, I'm going to, I, when I started up um, putting this PowerPoint together, I said, okay, what do you want? Well, I'm going to incorporate some of this in my speech um, only because it got way too long. So we cut out some of the specific ADA considerations and I'm going to fold it in as I go through. But um, I work for um, where, thank you. I work for the East Tennessee Technology Access Center. I'm going to say ETAC um, throughout this. And um, if you want my personal business card afterwards, please see me. Um, I uh, do their press releases. Um, I write articles about assistive devices such as this pen holder that um, is really useful for spinal cord injuries um, or arthritis um, and or or this pencil that has weights around it for people with tremors or this paintbrush um, that has a triangle a um, rubber triangle around it to help people with arthritis just to widen the paintbrush um, and that's just some examples of low tech technology um, that I um, usually show seniors, but um, I'm, um, and we, what we primarily do is help people reach their educational or employment goals through assistive technology, um, computers, vision equipment, hearing equipment, um, communication devices, and adapting computers. Um, but we do this, we, uh, we also have an arts program for children but we do this primarily so that people will become employed. Um, one third of people with disabilities have a job. Oh, want one. Um, you want to talk about high unemployment rates? We are in. Um, so. Um, and no one comes to us and trusts us politically and says, oh, we have to worry about you as a burning block. So, um, but we try to get people employed so that they can have a good life, so that they will have expendable income to go to a play, take an art course, um, go to a concert, and uh, enjoy the arts. Um, there are five assistive technology centers in the state, and um, there are no profit that do what we do. Three, at least three of them um, have designated arts and music programs. Um, 
and um, we also have a wheels program a durable medical equipment. If you need a walker and you live in the greater Niceville area for a theater production, maybe we can help you out and lend it to you, um, or a wheelchair. Um, our, our goals for our arts and music program is primarily to um, provide children with arts and music um, just to let, include them and give them that experience. We do this through partnerships. We have had an ABC grant from the Earth Commission, and now we have fundraisers for that, and we're having one <laughs> November 3rd, and we're all going to be dancing to a Cuban law a live Cuban band and um, and we're teaching people how to tango and all these dances. Um, but the supporters of this, the main supporter of this has a daughter who has cerebral palsy and she started taking piano lessons and her fingers became more nimble. And he then saw her buttoning her coat and he went, hey, you can do that. How did you do? How did, were you able to do that? And she said, piano lessons. I have another friend who uh, took one someone with cerebral palsy and he was playing piano with his knuckles and now he's stretched out his fingers to play. So, um, but we um, also promote artists um, with disabilities in our, um, in our adventures. Um, this is our latest um, summer camp. We had a week-long um, summer camp, and um, there are, um, and I have another slide on that one. You can't see all these. We insist that we have kids with and without disabilities in the summer camp. There were nine kids with disabilities and oftentimes you couldn't tell which ones were and which ones weren't. There were a total of 27 kids and um, we, um, and they just, had a great time. Um, the variety of disabilities was never ending. Um, and we had chalk drawing and I asked, oh, did anyone run out into the streets? Because we had one arts organization one music organization not willing to work with us at one point because they worried that a child with autism would run out into the, in the, the busy street on them. And so that didn't happen. <laughs> you know, people are, get so worried. Um, we also have a film night and um, quarterly and 
some people from a uh, rural community an hour and a half drive away come down if they are served by a day and residential provider uh, community um, group and um, about 20 of them arrived in wheelchairs and they said the reason we're here is when we go to the movies there may be one or two places set aside for them, and if it's stadium sitting, it's all in the front, and they're looking at like this. And so um, they will end. It's such a rural community that they don't even have a movie theater there. Um, so we um, did this quarterly and we're showing the Grinch in December if you <laughs> want to come see the Grinch with us. I will say though that at the Tennessee Theater in Knoxville that was renovated maybe five years ago, every other aisle on the aisle seat, you can take off the armrest and a wheelchair user can slide in. That's what we like to see if you're renovating a theater um, to think in terms of not just putting us in the back on the sides or having a space way up front, um, for people with, dis with mobility disabilities. Um, and this is another shot of the summer camp. Um, now, we also promote um, our, our um, a local artist, um, George Watson has a communication disability and that's why we saw him initially, but he has taught himself and taken classes to paint and we highlighted him one day um, and his his artwork fills our training room. Um, and uh, we brought down Emmanuel Lowe uh, from Chicago um, to sing for us. She's 12 years old and, um, and composes her own music and um, it, and she's been blind since birth. So, um, and one of our board members said, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have her come? And then we turned off the lights and we ate in the dark and <laughs> we experienced sort of what it's like for a, uh, for a bit. Um, Gatlin came to us uh, needing a keyboard that he can use and um, he now creates this artwork on the computer and he asked me, oh, um, will this help me be discovered by <laughs> sending this? And I said, well, I can send you, I can send people um, your email and they can contact you. Um, but he really is into these textures. Um, he uses uh, Adobe Photoshop. Um, Derek has autism and anyone in the Gwen or Knoxville area probably knows him because his mother 
promotes his artwork. Um, this is his fish. And um, he has been asked by Governor Haslam to create the Tennessee ornament for their White House this year. So I do include him. Um, he doesn't speak, but we're now fixing his computer, so I think he can type and write. Um, Bill Coulson lives in Oak Ridge, and he has ALS, um, Lou Gehrig's disease. He operates his computer by pressing something like that staples um, button that says it's so easy. Um, he operate. He has two um, muscles he can control. His eye, his eyes, and he can blink when he wants to say yes, and blink twice when he means no. Um, he, um, but he also has one toe on his left foot. And you can't see it here, but he's pressing that button on that toe with his toe. And he's operating this computer that has something called Sibelius. Um, Compute um, music capability to um, compose music. He was at MTSU um, getting his degree in recording industry management when ALS hit him at 24. Um, and he was playing in a rock and roll band, and um, they were singing his songs. He was living his dream, and he can now um, create his own music using that computer program. He probably won't create Finlandia like Sibelius did, but. Um, it, um, and um, and then there's Erin. She also has ALS. She lives in Nashville, um, and she has. And you can't really see it, but there's a laser beam right here on her headband around here that she drives at her computer to create art. And around the borders of this, it says, big wheels keep on turning. Proud Erin keeps on rolling, rolling on the pavement. And this is where I'm digressing from this and saying, Gatlin and Erin will gladly let you show their work. However, if you have a gravel parking lot, if you have no ramp, if you have no accessible parking, if you have just one step into your art gallery, she may let you show it, but she may not show up for your opening reception. Um, and now maybe she would, but I avoid places that I can't get into um, this. Um, so, um, and she, um, and if you are going to show her art, you might want to lower it. 
um, think in terms of where, how high you're hanging things, making them comfortable once in a while for um, walking individuals. Um, we um, our art work of George Watson is all lower. Um, and yeah, I know. Um, and these are websites for foot painters and foot photographers. Um, and um, this is uh, Kelly Smith who um, decided she wanted to dance with a uh, one dance group in town. Um, now I. I want to say that um, I went to their website and tried to get more pictures and just got videos. But I also saw a video of them showing us how you get to their studio and it's to go down a winding staircase and then through a back alley, and I went, oh man, <laughs> um, how is this enticing? But uh, apparently they do have a, a group of wheelchair dancers. Um, I'm just gonna run through how they make adaptations or combinations. For me in my pottery class, I'm really not a slab in that um, left hand picture. I can do this, I can walk around the thing, but I do it very slowly. So when we're really pushed, but a lot of people are wanting the slab roller. Um, but then, I don't let anyone take it to the table for me. That's why I bring my walker in and it's on the seat. Um, I also cannot pick up these big heavy pails of glaze or mix it up in the sink. So I, my art instructor does that for me. Um, but I can certainly glaze, um, no problem. And I can mop the floor, clean it up afterwards. So um, and you have to individually accommodate people. And I, I did make this silver bracelet. Everyone in the class was used to working with wire um, and uh, and they were all tightly weaving it like the gold thing below and at the end one of the class participants said um, how did you do that with the, all those holes in there and I said, because I don't have the strength in my hands to pull it tightly like you did. And they all said, oh, that's so beautiful. And I'm like, no, you're so beautiful. So um, disability can be an, an advantage sometimes. So I'll leave you with that. Um, any questions? I know <clears throat> I know that we are, are um, kind of uh, short for time. I have just a few more things I want to say, and I really do want to, if you have questions, it's really important that we hear those, but there are a couple of things I, I do want to kind of run over, and they will only take me a little bit as soon as we get back to, let's see. And, and, I'll, and I'll just say that Louise and I are going to be here. We're staying tonight, and then we're going to be at the plenary, excuse me, the first plenary tomorrow morning. So there'll be opportunities if you want to talk to Louise or, or me. Um, we're, we'll be here. 
Um, so here's some walking away things for programming for success. Name your Title 504 and your Title VI coordinators. Have a plan. Start with your inner circle. That's your board, your staff, your volunteers. Partner in your community. You have already seen the results of, of a great partnership that has just begun. We've only known each other for maybe three months, and we've already begun to work. Um, I'm now partnering also with the Tennessee Coalition of Developmental Disabilities. I'm partnering with Vanderbilt. They have one of the centers of, two centers of excellence in the state. There are resources. See the resource list on the TAC website for accessibility and Title VI partners. Consult with the TAC staff directly or with the federal government. Focus TAC grant projects on an access issue. Oftentimes, you know, when I read grant applications and I look at under accessibility and, and I don't think that we're really embracing what you could do. Maybe if you're a presenter and you want to have a special show where you're doing special captioning and you want to market to that, there are all kinds of things that can be done. Market your existing accessibility efforts. Just because, you know, a lot of times we hear that um, we have stuff but nobody ever uses it. Well, have you ever let the community know that you have it available? You have to let them know. And the way you let them know is through networks like this right here, through the ADA network, through the Tennessee Coalition, through the Tennessee Council, the people that deal with the disability community every day. And one of the things that I have really learned, because I am a new person to this field, is, you know, a very much a catchphrase all over the United States is nothing about them without them. So to make policy and to make procedures without actually maybe employing an artist with disabilities or maybe finding someone on your board who has disabilities without actually talking to, to the community is a mistake. Um, train your staff and volunteers. Integrate inclusivity into the fabric of your services and programs. Employ artists from the disabled community. And this is just sort of a pictorial demonstration of the fact that you're not alone. This is not something easy. It's certainly not something that can be solved overnight. It's not something that you can just kind of flip a switch. It may, it may take a long time. I was talking to a constituent today, and the thing that I reminded her is that it doesn't have to be fixed, but you have to have a plan. And you can have 25 years to make that plan work, but you have to have a plan and you have to be working toward it. Um, and I really love the comment that our presenters made about the fact that the ADA legislation is over 22 years old. And after actually talking with the Department of Justice um, a couple of months ago, there are no excuses for not acting. There are lots of leeway for beginning to act. There's lots of, of, of for having a plan and beginning to move forward, but there are no excuses for just not, for pretending it will go away. Um, if you have any questions, I, I don't know what the best way to handle this since we're over time, um, but, but we started really late. But if there are any questions, I would like to at least take a couple. Um, what would um, what were the accommodations you made to market that as an accessible movie? Was it purely in the seating capabilities, or were there other things? Um, we also got a closed caption movie, and we have video description on it as well for the blind um, or those with low vision. Um, and we just did our normal, I did the normal press releases and we um, did a lot of so, um, social networking and we have a huge list of people we, um, we normally um, reach out to. So, oh, yeah, great. in the back, someone you had, yeah. Um, good question. I, I get a lot of questions about whether or not there are, well, where people can find assistance 
I get a lot of questions um, about where people can find financial assistance to bring their um, buildings and uh, facilities up to um, disability um, accessibility. And I still, after many years of working in this field, don't know where, because sometimes the arts division can't find um, bricks and mortar type of um, and So do you all have any resources? Well, I will say first, it is a civil rights law. So, um, yes, it is an expensive one, but. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, but but I, I guess part of it is you, you look at for older, more established buildings, anytime you renovate or you, or you're a new construction, there's a whole new set of, that's a different kettle of fish. But if, 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 if you're in an existing place, you look at what's called readily achievable barrier removal, which you know has a lot of discussion about that. Um, but basically, you start looking at: is the parking lot accessible? Is there a van accessible spot? Is there a path of travel into or into towards the entrance? And then can people get into the entrance? Is the door wide enough? Is there is no step zero entrance? Once they're in, can people get around? You might need to move some things. Now, a lot of times, it's not really costly. It might be restriping the parking lot. Um, you know, I, I, I had somebody that purchased a, a parking lot striper so he could do it himself. Um, taking a look at what it is, and, and, and as, as William said, making that plan, you're moving towards greater access. So start looking at that. There are also tax credits and tax deductions for small businesses. Um, and well, is the text and the, for um, and for other types. I think the deductions. Let's see, the deductions are for all business. But anyway, there's tax credits and tax deductions that we can, you know I can make sure you get some money, uh, some well, money, <laughs> some some knowledge about. Yeah, if, if you're a nonprofit. Non then what? Okay. <laughs> yeah, but if if you've got any any piece yeah. on the other. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times connecting with folks that can, do, can make something more accessible. Um, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Um, we're going to have to cut this off. But, um, oh. Okay. Um, you know, I was trying to make a point. I was just going to answer to your question, too. I, I'm the mother of a son with uh, autism. Mm -hmm. And a so very, yes, yes. And, and a very um, easy accommodation is to lower, you know, the, the, the um, children with autism or adults with autism are, are oversensitive sometimes. So just dimming down the lights or the noise levels, um, and also having a day that is available for people to bring their children and feel free because a lot of families of kids uh, with autism don't get to go out very much because of the societal attitudes. People look at you, they tell you all sorts of things like Donna was saying. Um, so I think that's something that we can all do to help folks. Well, I, I, want to, I want to close this off. And I want to say that as soon as I can get, if you guys will, as grantees, and as whether you're a coordinator or just an interested party, I am going to start an email sort of discussion um, with regard to ADA issues that will be sort of in-house TAC. So if you will start to contact me with survey information or just questions, I will start collecting that information and we will keep this conversation alive. Thank you so much for coming and, and have a good evening.